This week we're going to hear about applications, and um, first speaker is going to be Balaji Srinivasan, who's joining us remotely um, from Zoom, and he's going to talk to us about applications today and some that we, we think are exciting on the near-term horizon. Okay, so with that, I'm, I'm going to get straight into the presentation, so we can turn it over to Balaji, who's going to join us on the screen here. There he is. Hello. Hey, Balaji. So uh, my name is Balaji Srinivasan. I've got a new project um, at nakamoto.com, which you can check out, basically like a crypto blog. Um, but today I'm going to talk about uh, crypto applications. Uh, just to give a little overview of who I am, so it's a rare photo of me in a suit, um, you know, maybe like last time in a few years. Uh, and uh, my background, um, so, you know, Stanford uh, grad, um, it's a PhD in electrical engineering, MS in chemical engineering. Um, I founded a genomics company, which ended up selling to Myriad for 375. I was a general partner at Anderson. Um, I sold a crypto company to uh, called Earn.com to Coinbase and served as CTO. Um, and I've basically been an early crypto person and, and venture investor and angel investor and so on. And I'm at Twitter at, at BalaGS. So if you have any questions about the talk, you can just DM me there or, or ask me. So ha happy to answer questions. Okay, so just jumping in, um, today I want to talk about kind of crypto applications in, uh, you know, in 2020 and then also beyond, like, you know, things are at scale in 2020 and then beyond that point. Before we, we, we get to those applications, I want to talk through a little bit of the history of how we got to the present moment um, and some, some kind of underpinning concepts uh, behind all crypto projects and then talk about the applications kind of with that, with that mental framework. So first history, um, let's talk briefly about why Bitcoin is invented in the first place. And this may be obvious to some of you, uh, but for those for whom it's not, um, let, let's go through this quickly. So the idea is, uh, you know, if you start with physical cash, something you take for granted with physical cash is if I go and I hand Jesse a dollar bill, then I no longer have that dollar bill and Jesse has it. And we take for granted the fact that that dollar bill can't be in two places at the same time. It's, it's a physical object. It can only be in one place at a time. So if we try to translate that naively into the digital realm, and we take the, the serial numbers on that Federal Reserve note, and we say, hey, well, that's a, that's a unique identifier. Why don't we email that? Why don't I email that to, to Jesse? The issue is that I still have a copy of those serial numbers, and I could go and email it to Kim or to, or to Mark or to Ben. And so there isn't an inherent form of scarcity in the digital realm, um, unlike in the physical realm where that, that dollar bill is actually only in one spot at a time. So, so naive digital cash doesn't work. This is called the so-called double spending problem because there isn't a native form of scarcity. And the way that we solved this prior to the invention of Bitcoin and still used you know, very, very frequently today is to have a central trusted party um, a bank or a financial institution, which takes a debit from A and then goes and credits B, okay? And um, by, by doing this, we've now introduced a, a third party into the equation, and, and we're trusting this, this central actor. We're trusting them to debit A and to credit B. And um, with that trust comes power because they, you know, this, this kind of institution can, uh, for example, deny a payment or it can credit itself you know, with quantitative easing you know, via, via central banking system. But from a computer science topology, it's generally inelegant to have a privileged node if you can avoid it. And so what Satoshi Nakamoto did was he was able to come up with a decentralized data structure, uh, the blockchain, and essentially had um, something over here where we're basically miners. Um, so, so rather than having a centralized actor, a bank that was debiting and crediting, Satoshi replaced it with a decentralized network of these miners who each compete to debit A and credit B. And if any one of them decides for a reason not to try to mine a transaction, the other ones will mine that transaction because anybody who mines the transactions gets rewarded in Bitcoin for doing so. And so uh, a critical mass of them would have to collude in order to stop A from transmitting money to B, and they're highly incentivized to, to not do that. Um, and so this is kind of the magic of, of Bitcoin is it replaced the centralized actor, a bank, with a bunch of competing um, you know, entities called miners that, that carry out the same transaction approval processes and also the money, money generation processes. Okay, so that's, that's kind of why Bitcoin was invented, was, is to give an analog of physical cash that solves the presence of a, 
a digital analog of digital cash that solves the presence of the central actor. Okay. Now, this entity over here, this blockchain, uh, is something that got abstracted out. And, uh, you know, basically, once you've solved the problem of having a database of all the money in the world or all the Bitcoin in the world, you can do lots of other things. You can think of the blockchain as a tamper-resistant database for storing things of value. So, of course, you could use it to send and receive Bitcoin. Um, with the development of Ethereum about five years after uh, the, the launch of Bitcoin, this is a new blockchain that um, essentially was more programmable than, than Bitcoin. So writing a program in Bitcoin is like an assembly language-like thing over here. But to use um, Ethereum Solidity, uh, you know, it looks more like JavaScript. And actually, it's kind of like JavaScript in the sense of it's easy to shoot yourself in the foot with, with Solidity. But nevertheless, it was more accessible to write programs with. And why would you, why'd you want to write programs? Well, so you know, rather than just debit A and credit B, you might want to debit A and then credit B today and C tomorrow and D next Thursday, and E if some condition is hit, and, and so on and so forth, right? That's what like smart contract programming is. And so because you could write you know, more sophisticated contracts in Ethereum, that led to the ICO boom. And you know, the ICO boom in 2017 and 2018 was kind of like the dot-com boom, where um, startups raised millions, in some cases billions of dollars, and uh, you know, folks were able to raise you know, $35 million in 30 seconds, all kinds of money flowed in. Um, and like the dot-com boom, there's a boom and bust, and many of those, you know, coins that, that got funded it dropped like 90% or more. And um, this, though, was, was something where, if you just look at it from a technological standpoint, the capital formation rails that were put in place were, you know, the, an ICO is like the simultaneous disruption of venture capital, SWIFT, crowdfunding, and cap tables, because you're, you know, you're doing startup investment, you're taking all these international wires, you're having large numbers of people do it at the same time. And you have something called a capitalization table or cap table, which is um, the, it's kind of the system of record, which says who owns what stock. That kind of thing was also pulled into the blockchain with, with these ICOs. So it's actually very important technologically, even if not all of these companies are successful. Then after 2018, 2019 to 2020, now we're in, you know, we're in the crypto winter in, in 2019, um, 2018, and now we're kind of maybe in the summer for innovation, where you know a lot of the, the decentralized finance stuff, which we'll get to, is really starting to work. Um, you've got interest, you've got loans, you've got you've got all these applications, uh, and, and things are starting to work in crypto. And it's kind of potentially laying the ground for the maybe the next boom. So, um, all right, so that gets us to the present day. So now let's talk about some concepts and start with technological concepts. So. You know, one thing we touched on earlier is, uh, you know, a blockchain is a database for storing things of value. So, uh, you know, digital gold and, and you know, uh, cash, but also tokens like in the ICO boom, um, digital assets as well. So, you know, in-game items or real estate, these are, these are called non-fungible because, you know, one piece of real estate is not the same as another, whereas one dollar bill is fungible, it's equivalent to another. And then there's like identity, right? So present proof of identity to demonstrate that you possess an asset. So... Um, you know, cash, you know, equity alternatives, digital assets, identity, these are all things where you can kind of store them in a blockchain because they're, they're valuable things. You know, with identity, for example, this is kind of a subroutine that was even required for Bitcoin or Ethereum in the first place. You had to present a, effectively a digital signature to show that you owned um, Bitcoin or Ethereum before you could move it. Uh, and so... Um, this is being factored out as its own thing. And just like if you can do identity theft, well, then identity is a valuable thing to steal. So that's the kind of thing that you might want to store in, in a blockchain in, in some fashion. So, so that's one way of thinking about blockchains. And you can also think of um, them from a different angle in terms of a protocol. So, you know, Bitcoin is a protocol and these crypto protocols have turned payments into packets. Uh, and I mean that in the most literal sense. You know, here is TCP, Transmission Control Protocol. Here's IP, the Internet Protocol. And the Bitcoin call runs on top of that. And you can actually see a block over here. And it's basically fully packet-driven transmission of value without reference to a bank. Because in these bytes, you don't see, um, you know, like uh, the USA or the Netherlands. You don't see Wells Fargo or HSBC. You don't see countries. You don't see bank names. You just see bytes. Um, it's really an internet-native uh, way of sending money, uh, which is cool because once we developed internet-native ways of sending um books and music and, uh, you know, songs and, and things like that, uh, well, we got the internet revolution. So, so it's pretty impressive. 
third concept, once, once you've turned you know, payments into packets, that means that machines can now hold and send money. So you can paste in a string of bytes over here and voila, now you can actually have a script that like sends money, right? And that's completely new. Um, you know, you, you can actually um, have a, a script that makes money for you when you sleep. This is like, you know, an intelligent agent uh, that people have talked about for, for 20 years, but it's actually there now. Um, you can have these primitive intelligent agents that go around or, or more sophisticated actually, and do trades on DEXs and are essentially, you know, decentralized exchanges and are essentially making money for you just by trading online. It's a script that actually holds the money itself intrinsically. So concept number four, um, you know, one way of thinking about it is there's, uh, you know, my friend Matt Huang has a, has a great tweet, which is um, crypto is underrated from the outside and overrated from the inside. Okay. So how is it underrated from the outside? Well, um, in many ways, blockchains have actually already posted technological improvements, 10Xs in various areas. For example, 10X gold, 10X swift. Um, so 10X gold, why? Because Bitcoin is lighter, faster, cheaper to, to transport. Um, it's 10X swift, you know, Ethereum clears in minutes in any country pair where Swift takes days, uh, Swift being international wire transfers. Um, 10X larger than Kickstarter. So, you know, a large crowdfund in 2015 was like 10 or 15 million, but in 2017, you know, it was like $4 billion, um, which is like a 100X increase. And regardless of what those things are, are that are being funded, simply the mechanism to move that much money and, and, and form that pool of capital is, is remarkable. And then in terms of, you know, like Delaware, right? Um, you know, you can hit enter in Solidity in seconds, actually have it incorporated into the blockchain in, in minutes. And you can set up something that looks a lot like a corporation um, in the sense of being able to receive money, distribute it, have, quote, binding contracts that the blockchain enforces and, and whatnot. And um, essentially, this, uh, this is much better than Delaware in many ways, because uh, when people go to Delaware to incorporate a company, um, that can take days. And in many ways, you know, people talk about a measure of economic freedom being the time to incorporate. Um, with smart contracts, you can 10x that too. So this gives you a flavor. Blockchains have 10x many financial primitives. And one 10x is a big deal, but a lot of them, you know, 10xing gold and wire transfers and VC and crowdfunding and cap tables and incorporation, that's actually a truly structural change and worth, worth paying attention to, even if it hasn't rippled out uh, fully yet, okay? Um, additionally, you know, the, uh, the, the crypto space has actually already created many millionaires and, and a few billionaires. Um, so the founders of coins, the miners who run, you know, large server farms or the exchanges, the, this analogy is used frequently, but I would compare the present moment to roughly 2000 in the internet, because in the 90s, there was this infrastructure phase and you had Yahoo and you had AOL um, and people, everybody had heard of the internet, but not everybody used the internet in, you know, 2000 on a daily basis. Uh, and that's very similar to kind of where crypto is. Everybody in finance, everybody in tech has, has heard of, you know, blockchains. Most people have heard of Bitcoin, even if you're non-finance or tech. The infrastructure phase is there. You've got the coins and the miners and the exchanges. The applications are, are being developed, which we'll come to. Sixth concept. So blockchains give you a choice of who to trust. So before you had to store money at a bank, you didn't really have a choice. And afterwards, you can still store it at a bank or at an exchange like Coinbase, or even locally on your computer. And I think this is a better framework than saying trustless. The goal is not to trust no one. It's about having a, a greater choice of who to trust with custody of valuable assets. So number seven, blockchains enable internet scale cap tables. So before um, you'd have something like this, like a spreadsheet basically, which said, what's a cap table? It's a capitalization table. It is essentially who owns what shares in the company. So Emily Wilson owns 2.618 million shares of common stock. Jake Pappas here owns 180K of series seed A and B stock, right? So this is a, like what a cap table is. And, you know, it, it can be said that a, a cap table is the most important data structure in technology because it underpins every company, right? This, you know, modest looking Excel type spreadsheet is who owns what percentage of the company. And right now that's basically held on, you know, Google Drive or, or maybe a Carta.com, which is an improvement. And, uh, and then it's like, you know, this, this file is the basis for, for millions of dollars being made in IPO. That's how property rights are managed. It, a far superior alternative is what the blockchain offers, where you can have 50,000, 100,000, millions of people um, who are token holders, and you can actually see every transaction back and forth. Um, you know, you're internationally tradable, transparent, liquid, and so on around the clock from day zero. And the blockchain is keeping track of who holds what, rather than, you know, someone making a Scrivener's error 
uh, you know, locally with, with an Excel file. So that's, that's a pretty big deal, not just the, the automation of it, but the scaling of it from a few hundred people to tens of thousands or, or beyond. So, you know, I, I think of blockchain first as like the, the new mobile first, um, where, you know, blockchain competitors are arising for many legacy businesses in P2P payments and messaging and crowdfunding, all the payment type stuff. Um, but also in um, other areas like, you know, uh, for example, DNS, you, people wouldn't have thought that you could, um, you know, launch competitors to DNS, but you can. So Handshake, ENS, you know, things like this are actually um, competitors to, to, the, to the DNS system. And, um, you know, folks like, uh, um, you know, Brave are using this to, to launch competitors to Chrome, which, which have crypto built in. And uh, you're, you're seeing like a flowering of innovation across many different verticals with crypto powered competitors. And, you know, so that's why I'd say like, you know, blockchain first is kind of like the new, new mobile first. It's like a, it's a technology that gives you balances. It gives you encryption. Um, it gives you a, a number of primitives to work with. So as a ninth concept, um, we think of blockchains as a tool that founders and, and, and engineers can use to break network effects. So if you take a network like Facebook, it's at scale, you know, billion users or what have you, it's got a present value over here. And uh, the thing about that is if you launch a new network, well, it's not Facebook, no one's on it, so why would you use it? Well, now you've got a new tool, which is you can issue your users tokens and those tokens have upside, which declines as the network gets larger. So now you actually give a financial upside to early adopters and this curve can offset this one. So now you've given like some value to people for joining early. And that's a very important concept because this is kind of like giving equity out to um, your, your employees uh, or you know, selling equity to your investors, except you're issuing tokens to your users. And while tokens aren't equity, um, the upside of them is something where users can work and they can they can appreciate, right? So, uh, so this is really interesting, and it's kind of turning your customers into investor-like entities, uh, and and that's something that I think will be a very big deal for breaking these network effects, like the the, the scaled um, social networks or two sided marketplaces. I think uh, blockchains are going to transform social networks in general. You know, before you know, last ten years we've been liking and poking and messaging each other, and afterwards we've been doing you know. Um, paid messaging, surveys, tasks, et cetera. And I think this is, a, this is a major transition from just, you know, like making friends to, haha, making money online, right? And uh, I think that's, that's important because it starts to actually increase the substance of what we're doing online. It's not just, not just wasting time or communicating. It's not wasting time, but it's pure information. It goes to transactions as well. Finally, just as an 11th point, I think of the blockchain as a partial move away from the cloud towards privacy. So, um, you know, Ledger sold its million hardware wallet for storing Bitcoin. Um, you know, this is something where um, anything that gets to like a million units like this, I think will probably eventually get to a billion. It might be bundled with phones. Like you have a phone, you have a charger, and you might get a hardware wallet alongside it. Um, and basically, what is a hardware wallet? It keeps your private keys locally. It protects them. And you could think of them as like an anchor uh, that may lead to other data also being encrypted and moved locally, like out of the cloud and, and you know, onto devices. And uh, the way that would work is basically that your keys might be kept locally, even if the, the bulk of the data is remote, it's only decrypted when you present your private keys. And, and for applications like Dropbox or Gmail, that's actually very feasible to do for the most part because... Um, you can have a relatively dumb data store in the cloud and then present your private key to decrypt it, such that the cloud provider can't see it and it's decrypted, you know, for example, client side. There's many modalities that are like that. I think, um, you know, hardware wallets are going to be a big part of pulling some data and some privacy locally. Um, now, let's talk about, you know, some, some concepts on the other side of things. So we talked on the tech side. Let's talk on the community side. So basically... Um, you know, building anything in crypto, you have to really understand the communities, whether it's Bitcoin maximalists or Ethereum holders or the XRP army. Um, you know, these are folks who um, are, uh, you know, they, they, they have a significant part of their identity is bound up in holding this currency. And it's actually kind of interesting. It's like, um, you know, the folks who live in the U.S. value the dollar, folks who live in Japan value the yen. Um, their geographic location is actually more salient for their identity formation. But when you've got folks who are on the internet, um, it's actually sort of like currency first as the formation of their identity. They're like Bitcoiners or Ethereumers or what have you. And you know, one way of thinking about what that does is if you just took three you know, random people off the street 
uh, each of them could win or lose on their own. And so, you know, they have no inherent economic linkage. If you have n people, you have two of the n possible win-loss combinations. With three people, you have two of the third or eight possible win-loss combinations. However, if they all hold Bitcoin, um, well, suddenly they're economically aligned, such that they all lose together or they all win together. And this is an important concept um, where basically, you know, if they're holders, none of them can win unless they all win. So blockchains take us from what I consider the slippery slope to the crypto cliff. Uh, you know, before you'd have um, like a registry like the Spain and Catalonia fight or the .cat domain, somebody could lose a lol.cat domain. It could be shut down by the Spanish government. You might still keep your .com domain. So you don't really care if it happens to them. It might, you know, we might feel bad, but it's not really your problem. However, if someone's ENS domain is seized, that really means interfering with the Ethereum blockchain. So it really is your problem as an Ethereum holder. And I think that's a really important dynamic, which turns us from you know, the slippery slope where one individual's rights can be abrogated at a time to the crypto cliff, where to seize one person's crypto is to seize everybody's. And that's a pretty big deal. So blockchains allow for experiments in self-governance. Um, and with blockchains, any, any sufficiently large group of people can now choose a monetary policy, choose an economic policy um, that, that suits them. And so I think we're seeing this really amazing thing where rule of law is being actually encoded. And one of the things this results in is that blockchains make macroeconomics and experimental science. Um, so whatever your thesis on the economy, whether inflationary, deflationary, demurrage, or what have you, before this had to be studied in the context of like video games with, with virtual points, like Edward Castronova did a lot of the pioneering work here. But now crypto has just taken that next level and you've got actual billion dollar or larger economies where you can just set the monetary policy and see what happens. So macroeconomics is finally becoming an experimental science because people are opting in and you can quote, run these experiments at large scale. It's very important to think about these things as we get into the applications that they'll come to. So tens of millions of people and billions of dollars are now invested in these experiments. The companies, the wallets, the percentage of folks, the market cap, right? These, these are things where um, you know, lots of folks are, are, are you know, the, the valuations are fairly high. They're not trillions. It's not hundreds of millions or billions using it, but it's definitely tens of millions. And uh, so what that's resulting in is, you know, there's this concept of the laboratory of the states, you know, that different states in the U.S. experiment with different um, legal regimes. Like some will legalize medical marijuana and others will have, you know, different laws on um, right to try laws or things like that. This is kind of like that where <clears throat> you have different coins with different monetary policies and they're like a laboratory of, um, laboratory of the states. So... That kind of you know, brings us to applications, right? So everything I just said is useful context for understanding what kinds of applications you'd build with crypto. Why was it invented in the first place? What has been done historically? What can be done with it, et cetera? Why don't we go into specific applications, starting with the ones that are already at scale as of 2020? So the first group are the ones I already mentioned. Exchanges, miners, and you know, like, uh, like issuers have made millions or billions of dollars, right? These are, these are folks who are at a billion plus in, in revenue or in, or in equity sales or what have you. These are like the infrastructure parts of crypto. The second group that is at reasonable scale are the hardware wallets. So ledgers at you know, 100 million plus revenue, at least in 2017. And um, that's about an order of magnitude less, but it's still, it's definitely rising. It's a curve to watch. Um, and will probably be built into kind of hardware devices over time. Uh, third group that's already at scale in 2020 that's worth mention of is um, our stable coins. Um, so a stable coin is, uh, you know, like what it sounds like, unlike a, a, you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum, it doesn't wobble, doesn't have high volatility. Um, a stable coin is, is flat, pegged at 1.00 USD. Um, and in theory, it could be pegged to something else, but usually it means stable in USD value. And uh, there's now a few different stable coins out there, and they have different ways of doing that peg. Some will say they um, have bank account deposits of U.S. dollars that will back the peg, and others uh, will, um, you know, have some asset on hand, whether Ethereum or something else, which is volatile and oscillates, but which, where they say that they're, uh, the, the net value of that is enough to support the peg. So stable coins are at significant traction. I mean, $5 billion nominal stored value is actually fairly high. And uh, DeFi, so decentralized finance is also at a reasonable scale. So since you know late 2018, it's really been soaring. It's now at like a billion dollars in stored assets. Um, there's a website DeFi Pulse, uh, which you know I screenshotted you know a little while ago, 
And, uh, you know, like all these things are just rising relatively quietly, but, but folks are, you know, doing well in the space. There's bugs. Um, there's a serious, you know, issue like a, like a few days ago. But, but in general, the vector is, is up. Okay, so those are things that are at scale in 2020, which are exchanges, miners, issuance, uh, hardware wallets, stable coins, DeFi. Okay, so what's the stuff that is up and coming, stuff that has, you know, green shoots in 2020 and, and might be big by 2025? This is, a, this is a, gonna be a long list of things. Um, and, uh, you know, happy to answer questions, but, and I'm not saying every single one of these is successful, um, but some of them may be, okay? So um, privacy coins. Um, oh, and by the way, just l assume I'm an investor in everything on this and everything in crypto, because I can, I'll, I'll you know, I, I, I hold lots of privacy coins. I hold, I'm an investor in, in lots of these things, um, but, you know, trying to give a neutral, neutral kind of thing. So privacy coins, um, you know, so Dash, Monero, Zcash, these are trying to add a layer of privacy over Bitcoin, um, where uh, essentially, um, you know, Bitcoin transactions are by their nature transparent in the blockchain. Um, Dash, uh, Monero, and Zcash in particular are using different technologies to uh, to obscure that so people have actual financial privacy, similar to the difference between HTTP versus HTTPS, right? Uh, number two, lending and interest. So Compound and Maker, um, you know, Compound is basically somewhere where you can earn interest on, on the blockchain. Maker, um, you can you know, do lending, and it's actually this interesting system where you, you can put down some Ethereum, and so long as the Ethereum price doesn't go down, you get some US dollar equivalent that you can go and do something with called DAI, DAI. Uh, in terms of scaling, there's a ton of stuff that's happening, lots of companies um, doing this. Some of these are quasi applications in their own right, like the Cosmos SDK. But there's a bunch of different ways to try to scale blockchains. And um, you know, these technologies may stack on top of each other. Um, the, you know, some of them are exclusive, but many of them are, are complementary. So together, these will allow for higher throughput blockchains. And that's an important thing to think of as you're developing applications. Decentralized coal storage, um, so Casa Hodel. Um, so basically, they're gaining some traction. Uh, interesting company where they're similar to Coinbase in, in some ways, but they basically resolve a paradox where you know, thesis is people want to store at home. The antithesis is, um, you know, they uh, they don't they don't know how to do that technologically. It's like product wise not feasible. And the synthesis is you you know store at home, um, but uh, you have a service that's helping you do that, right? So decentralized cold storage. Um, another application, Starkware. So you know, this is SaaS for gas, right? Uh, basically. Um, you know, smart contracts that are on chain and the charge for each API call. So, uh, you know, right now when you, when you set up an API, you have to set up a Stripe billing layer and, and quite, quite a lot of stuff, but it might be the kind of thing where you just put a snippet of code there, almost like a Lambda, AWS Lambda function, if you're familiar with that, put a snippet of code on chain and just set up billing and ta-da, you've got a function that can just execute and, and make you money. Um, so that's what I call SaaS for gas. Another kind of thing, um, so insurance. So uh, basically, when smart contracts fail, in theory, you can get a payout. Now, many of these things are themselves written in smart contracts, so you don't know if that'll um, that'll actually work. But it, it's you know it's it's certainly an interesting concept. Multi wallets, right? So this is something you know, my crypto I think is one of the best of these. But basically, beyond just send and receive, there's buy, sell, sign, vote, stake, register, and, and what have you. And um, these verbs, uh, you know, and by a verb, I mean action, I think are going to come to all wallets. So security. So um, Zengo is the first, uh, so it's like a, like, it's an innovation on security, which uses face ID for save and restore. And I think you're going to see this kind of innovation uh, where it becomes easier and easier and crypto eventually becomes easier to use and harder to lose than, than your traditional money over time. New financial instruments. So FOMO 3D and Pool Together, these are two examples. FOMO 3D was this interesting game theoretic thing um, where if you were the last person to deposit money, send money to this address, you'd get the pot. Um, but uh, if somebody else sent it, then they went ahead of you in, in, in the queue. And uh, so the game theoretic thing is if nobody else is sending it, then you should send some money. But if other people are sending some money, then you shouldn't send some. So it's kind of unstable equilibrium. And eventually, a guy won by just flooding the blockchain with transactions, um, had the Ethereum blockchain with transactions, and then you know putting uh, their transaction in to, to take the, the rest of the money out, which is very clever. Uh, pool together is kind of a different model where it takes folks' lottery-like instincts where they want to, quote, gamble money. Um, and instead, what they do is they kind of give you lottery-like payouts uh, for saving money. 
Um, so, you know, you could win 1644 every week just by saving your money. And uh, it's clever because it's, it's kind of something that takes lottery-like instincts and couples them to actually a pro-social behavior of saving money, which is very clever. So these are things that I think would be difficult to do in the traditional financial system, but that now we're starting to, to see versions of this, and it's a very promising area. So blockchain games, another promising area. So Forte will be talking about this, but you know, there's variants of this, some you know, that have micropayments built in, some of them that merge esports and, and crypto, um, others that you know, have uh, in-game potions or things like that. And so, you know, maybe you, it gives a new, you know, uh, definition to pro gamer. You're just racking up the crypto by, by playing these games, right? Um, crypto social networks like, you know, voice and Twitch are two of these, but there's a ton of them. These are still in their infancy. There's lots of different theories on how decentralized they need to be. Uh, should they be, you know, decentralized um, at just the currency level? Should they be decentralized at the application level? We have to figure all this stuff out. Um, but but some of these are things where the application centralized, the coin itself uh, is decentralized, and, and they just kind of go with that. So then decentralized DNS. So ENS, Unstoppable, Blockstack, Handshake. Uh, these are essentially domain names that you can programmatically register and then work with, um, and you don't have to go through DNS. And that itself is actually kind of useful where, boom, you can deploy a website and actually get a custom domain just for that website. So it's actually fully deployed, which is actually better for testing than the current paradigm of staging and, and test domains. Um, automated market making. Now, I'm actually kind of bearish on this, uh, but it, it's worth mention. Um, you know, things like Uniswap or the concept of bonding curves, uh, you know, they, they're trying to give liquidity to the long tail, uh, such that anybody can come up to effectively a smart contract and, and, and get a fair price from it back. The tricky part with this is there's various kinds of market manipulations in theory that you can do outside of that smart contract. And um, you know, we'll, we'll see if these survive over the long term. I'm wishing them well. Um, but, and it's worth mentioning to understand the concept of like an automated you know, like, like, uh, like market maker. Um, but but we'll, we'll see if these work. Decentralized identity. So, um, you know, three box is good. There's like a decentralized dot identity. Uh, but th these are essentially folks who are trying to um, use, uh, you know, Ethereum or uh, other cryptocurrencies for sign on and not just payments. Um, and uh, so I think this is something where you might need to see like the equivalent of a fiat exchange, which lets you exchange fiat currency for cryptocurrency. You might need to see something similar, which lets you exchange fiat identity, like a driver's license or passport, for a crypto identity of some kind. Then, you know, personal tokenization. So Ruben Brubanathan did something with CNSL. Spencer Dinwiddie has launched a token. Um, so folks are issuing tokens for their time or some function of your time, like a consult. I think this is actually a pretty important and big thing. Mutuals and guilds, so Moloch DAO and Gitcoin. So these allow people to vote with their funds for like the direction of protocol development. And they attempt to incentivize like, you know, collective action. Um, and, you know, we'll see if these work. I think the fundamental issue is, Folks who are um, investing, um, you know, th their money in something, they're, you know, to simply improve the protocol, there's always a free rider problem where the person who doesn't invest the money can still benefit from improvements to the protocol. So we haven't yet solved that. Uh, one possibility is you're a corporate entity or you're, you know, a very interested individual and you want to steer the protocol in this direction versus that direction. And so, like, voting with your wallet for development is an interesting model, like what, how, how Gitcoin is working. Um, founders rewards. So just like scaling, this is a it's kind of a technology or business model thing you should be aware of as designing applications. So Zcash pioneered this concept of founders reward where people get a cut of the Zcash mining and other folks are getting this as well, BCH and others, or, or they're, they're, they're trying something like this. And uh, this is a new business model for funding developers from rewards. And it's interesting because it gives a model, for example, for progressive decentralization. You know, you can have a founder's reward, which, you know, in the first few years, and then it kind of draws off over time. And after 10 years, you don't get any more um, without the community re-upping you. And that's kind of like a 10-year vest, but for a decentralized protocol. Uh, and it's a clever way of making money um, for the founders uh, for, for developing this thing, but still having it be, you know, decentralized in, in many other ways. So on-chain bounties, um, so Tezos, uh, you know, basically had this concept where the developer bounty concept like Gitcoin, but putting it on-chain, which I think is a novel, novel kind of concept. Um, clients for dApps, so like Instadapp, for example, makes it, you know, easy uh, to, to interface with, with all these DeFi applications, kind of like a Coinbase layer on top. 
developer tools, so Alchemy and, and Bison Trails, uh, improved APIs for Geth, general performance improvements. If you're you know just sending tons and tons of transactions down to you know the blockchain, you might want some of these as as kind of an intermediary. Um, oracles and prediction markets, so Erasure, Augur. Um, there's also like Chainlink and, and stuff like that. Basically, uh, right now you can only really bet on prices on you know the Ethereum blockchain directly. But if other kinds of data feeds are put in there, then you can place bets on those. And Augur is live, and, and folks are, are trying that out. Other folks are trying different kinds of oracles as well to place the data on, on chain so you can make bets on it. Um, DAOs. So this is worth a mention. Kind of you know. The simplest version of this are the intelligent agents we mentioned earlier, but you could have um, these organizations uh, with, you know, the A in DAOs, whether they're actually autonomous or what have you, is TBD. But, but essentially, um, it's something where you know trading money on these exchanges is kind of like pure internet arbitrage, um, and I think you're going to see that with with, with intelligent agents, and you're going to see more besides that. Community or an organization, so. These are collectives like cooperatives that are owned by their users. And I think you're gonna start seeing um, that become a lot easier to do with crypto. Um, like, a, like a group, it doesn't have to be like a normal corporation. It could be a thousand folks in a group decide to set up something that's producing good for the members. And, and that's kind of cool. It's like a fusion of, of groups and, and capitalism and, and so on online. So that kind of brings us to the close. I, you know, I surveyed a ton of different kinds of applications there. The goal was just to give a sense of how broad the space is. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions or, or take them. Maybe Jesse, you can, you can tell me. Yeah. Thanks, Baji. I'm gonna try and actually join the Zoom meeting so that you can see folks during the Q&A. Let's see if that works. Oh, wow, lots of people. There's lots of people. Okay, cool. Um, well, thank you for that presentation. That was great. So. Yeah, let's open it up to Q and A. Does does anyone have questions? And in, in order for Balaji to hear you, we're gonna have to give you the mic. So hold your question till you get a mic. Hi, uh, my name is America, one of the Cyber Co twins. I'm really interested in the trend of DeFi, but I saw something very curious where an artist was um, token was they were using her NFT to collateralize for a loan. Do you see? a trend of collateralized gaming instead of just collateralized loans? Because I feel like, one, you must have money to like participate in DeFi, but if you have assets, maybe that's an entry to, uh, to get into the space. Yeah, it's a great question. Fundamentally, that depends upon uh, the price for that asset. And um, the issue is that, uh, you know, currently, you know, the way that Maker or something like that is working is with Ethereum as collateral, and there's a large and robust and global liquid market for what one ETH is worth. Um, but if you have a painting or digital painting or something like that, um, you're, you can use this collateral if and only if uh, you have a large enough market to give a price on it. Now, that might be just one person, um, but that person would have to have some kind of binding contract. They'll buy it back at a certain amount um, such that the, the person will extend you credit. I think it's possible. I think these markets have to become deep enough to provide pricing for, for non-fungible assets. Hi. Uh, in the you know past you know 15 years with internet companies, a lot of value capture has come from either data monopolies or attention. And I'm curious for the crypto applications coming up you know, over the next five, 10 years. Do you see any like large themes of where value capture is going to come from? Well, that's a great question. Um, so I'm actually very bullish on uh, tasking in general. So like um, you know we did at Earn. Uh, you know, Earn has gotten to several hundred million dollars as, uh, in sales under Coinbase Earn, where all of these crypto issuers are, for example, if you're a new user to Coinbase, you can get like $180 in free crypto at Coinbase Earn. And the reason for that is all of these asset issuers are basically paying users to do tutorials and tasks and learn how their coin works, like send a private transaction with Zcash or take out a loan with Make or Die and so on and so forth. So that's cool because it's the better than free economy. Rather than just try to hack your attention, people are actually paying you for it. Um, and I think that's going to be a major area of tasking. And I think that's going to go from hundreds of millions of sales in, in the last few years to billions and eventually tens of billions. So that's kind of one area. And crypto uniquely enables that for a lot of reasons, but one that I think is really underappreciated. So if you think of Stripe, um, you know, Stripe is a multi billion dollar company, like $30 billion company, because it improved over PayPal on pay ins. 
right? You know, setting up a, a form to just receive credit card payments, people thought of as a solved problem. It was actually a huge pain with PayPal, and Stripe, you know, made that much better and, and therefore improved pay-ins. But if pay-ins on the internet were hard, pay-outs are even harder. And one way of thinking about that is if you just think to yourselves, okay, how many websites have you put a credit card into? It's probably dozens, if not hundreds. If you say, how many websites have you put your bank account into to get paid? That's actually much smaller, right? It's probably like, you know, maximum five to 10 and usually not even that. Maybe if you're an Airbnb host, an Uber driver, maybe PayPal has it, Coinbase has it, but not too many websites have your bank account information because a, bank, a website with your bank information can debit rather than credit. So improving payouts on the internet is something crypto does since with Earn, for example, we could pay out 10,000 people by hitting enter, right? So that's why I'm very bullish on tasking and earning and so on in general. And I hope that actually helps make the internet more positive sum because <laughs> right now there's a lot of fighting um, and it would be better if folks accumulated, you know, $10,000 rather than 10,000 likes, you know, I think. Um, so that's like one major area. I could give others, but that's one. Hey, Balaji, thank you for the presentation. I have a question for you with regards to social. So I see sort of a lot of development on one side with Signal and with uh, organizations like Matrix, but there's a version of the future where you'd imagine every email has you know, an amount attached to it or every tweet has a stake to it and you can filter based off of some kind of economic incentive. Do you think that future will come? Definitely, and uh, here's why. I think over the last several years, um, you know, different parts of email have been factored out, right? So, you know, emails between friends have gone to Facebook. Emails within companies have gone to Slack. Um, emails kind of to strangers, I mean, there's Substack and that's kind of coming back, but there's Twitter and so on for that. Um, so, so really the primary use of email today is for two things. First, it's for things like receipts, um, password resets, uh, you know, th that type of stuff, right? And, uh, you know, what people call transactional email. Um, and uh, second, it's uh, inter-corporate inter email. So you are a sales rep contacting another person at a dot com trying to get their attention. Now, um, I think that channel, because you're proposing a commercial transaction much of the time, is something where legitimately you could put a dollar sign on the edge. Okay. So because it's a commercial transaction, you could put a dollar cent on the edge and it's not unreasonable. Whereas with a friend, you know, paying them for their attention wouldn't seem right. Um, you know, for a coworker, paying them for their attention may not seem right unless it's a very, very large company, um, you know, where you know, maybe there's some bonus or something you're doing. Um, but for a stranger who you're proposing a business relationship with, it's not an unreasonable thing to do. Uh, and uh, so moreover, if you think about email, uh, your email inbox is a to-do list that somebody else is writing. So if they want something to go to the top of your to-do list, simply paying you to get to the top of the to-do list is actually good. Now, there, of course, there's tweaks to this. Many folks um, who are wealthy enough may not actually care about it from a, um, from a money standpoint, but they might care about it from a signaling standpoint. And so they could just elect to donate all the money that they receive to charity and maybe donate $50,000 a year to charity simply to sort messages by priority so that a stranger who really needs to reach them can do so. Uh, and so that's some, a way that you can use it for prioritization and, and still do good at the same time. And that's actually what a bunch of A6NZ partners did with, with Earn.com. They donate to Black Girls Code, donate to worthy causes, people get to the top of their inbox. So I do think we're gonna see another version of that. When deciding which apps to include on the 2025 list, were there what were some criteria you were using? Was it mostly based on usage right now or kind of from first principles, et cetera? Oh, um, I think, you know, so 2025, it's basically a grab bag of stuff I've been paying attention to. Um, I was trying to be broad and pick a bunch of different things, everything from hardware wallets to privacy coins, DeFi, new chains, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I actually probably, you know, what I undercovered maybe is new chains, but those are almost sometimes the most covered. You know, you can just scroll down coin market cap and take a look at them. Um, basically, I thought of them all as things that I could see some version of that concept working, if not the specific company. You know, like I'm pretty sure crypto games, for example, are going to be a thing by 2025. It just people want to make money on esports. Crypto lets you monetize better. You know, that, that seems like, a, like an obvious thing. So, yeah, I, I, I'm bullish on most of those trends, but... It was just kind of a grab bag of things I thought useful to mention. I, I could probably do another 20 slides, frankly. 
Um, but just, it was just kind of a selection. Hey, uh, I'm just wondering what you think crypto is going to do for like the future of work and employment. Cause I know you mentioned tasking. Um, it sounds kind of like you're thinking that, uh, like employment will be sort of unbundled with like bounties and other things like that. So, um, how do you think about that in terms of, uh, the way people are going to actually be employed by companies in the future? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, the thing is that, um, so I do think that there's going to be a huge scaling up of micro tasks for machine learning training. And the reason I say that is uh, we haven't yet, you know, so we've been using machine learning, you know, to train things like image recognition and, 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 and stuff like that. What we haven't done is ask experienced uh, doctors um, and lawyers. And I mean, there's, there's folks who have trained certainly medical imaging, machine learning, but we haven't gotten all this information out of the brains of skilled people. Um, and eventually, you know, for example, a bunch of lawyers annotate a contract as that language is non-standard, this language is standard. Um, you know, a, a number of, uh, let's say, photographers say, oh, that photo is bad, this photo is good. There's actually a ton of stuff we, are, we still are going to be doing in terms of taking skilled information, digitizing it, and, and pulling it in. Um, and, and eventually what that does is it allows, you know, the doctor to just focus on the really hard cases, and the automated diagnosis can take care of other things. Kozlo has talked a lot about this. Uh, so... So I think there, there will be an avenue for that, kind of like much, much more in the way of training data. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's hard to fully, fully, fully factor out a job into only micro tasks um, because there's a lot of shared context, right? Um, it, it's, it's something where, uh, you know, I, I think you could make it work for programming first, where you'd have a GitHub repository, you have 500 open bugs, and then you put 100 bucks on each of them and you put $50,000 out there and you let the sharks devour it, right? That is to say, on each of those, like, you know, uh, GitHub itself actually has GitHub um, bounties now, um, or uh, is it bounties, it's called something else, GitHub rewards or what have you. And the, the concept would be you put $50,000 out there, 100 bucks on each ticket, and you just let the piranhas, all the open source developers, try and go and solve them. And maybe that'll work, uh, but you're also going to need some kind of approval process. So maybe you need another $50,000 to pay reviewers of those tasks and what have you. So I think it might work in programming first. It might work in books. I think we need some real innovations in kind of MapReduce for labor before that works. And that's non-trivial. I think it's feasible, but non-trivial. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, my name is Jeff. Uh, and I guess my question is, um, so blockchain offers a lot of really interesting possibilities for identity. Um, and really in like a very different way that than real world identity works today. And I was hoping maybe you can just expand on what you think the opportunities there are. Um, yeah, so, so I gave a talk on this called the pseudonymous economy. And um, the concept is that um, in the pseudonymous economy, um, people earn under one name, they speak under another name, and their real name is yet a third name, right? So you treat your real name, quote unquote, you know, and I put it in quotes because, uh, you know, a real name is a state assigned name. Um, you know, you can't sequence somebody's genome and determine their real name. Um, you can determine, you know, like, like their blood type and other kinds of things by, by, you know, from the blood, you cannot determine their real name. So, you know, you're, if you treat your real name as a social security number, uh, and you might say, well, that's really atypical biology. Why would someone do that? Well, I can give you an environment where hundreds of millions of people do that every day, and that's Reddit, right? Like hundreds of millions of people are effectively pseudonymous all day on Reddit, and they just use whatever name suits them. They build up reputation under that name, and they can switch to other names and, and what have you. And like the one convention all these people on Reddit go by is that doxing is bad, right? Mapping the real name to the physical person is bad. And one of the reasons for this is, you know, I kind of half joke about this, but I think by like 2040 or thereabouts, doxing will be like considered like one of the worst things you can do because um, if you dox somebody, you get their address. If you get their address, then, you know, you can like, you know who they are. You can cause harm to them in the physical world. So I think that you're going to see a huge burgeoning of pseudonymous identities, not just for communication, which we've already had over the last 20 years, but for earning. And so people will live their entire lives for the most part pseudonymously and they will say nothing controversial under the pseudonym that's earning. And then they'll have all their controversial stuff for their pseudonym that's speaking, and then they will file their forms on yet a third pseudonym, which is just, you know, the, or the, the real name, which is the government identity. Um, and, you know, this is already actually happening among, you know, Gen Z, of which I'm sure some of you have either are or have uh, uh, 
you know, siblings who are, where, you know, they have a Finstagram and a, Rin, and a Rinsta, right? So a Finsta is their like fake Instagram and a Rinsta is their real Instagram. And on the fake Instagram, uh, they're under a fake name, but they're being their real self, um, you know, and on the Rinsta, they're under a real name, um, but they're being their fake self because they're posting photos in Sunday best with mom and dad or whatever, and they're not letting it all hang out. So this kind of multiple identity order as opposed to multiple identity disorder is kind of already there among, you know, younger kids. Um, and, and so I think that's basically where society is going. And I think crypto is going to help with that because it'll allow people to earn under those different identities, which really closes the loop. Cool. Okay, great. But thank you very much, Bawaji. We appreciate the presentation.